when you join me in a word of prayer. God, we thank you now for the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. It's in him that we live and we move and we have our being. It's because, God, of your presence that we have nothing to fear. And so now, God, as we open up the book, we pray that you would breathe on us all, that you'd allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. You are our redeemer. And we believe in you now to move someone to the point of faith and decision. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I want to invite your attention back to Revelation, Revelation chapter 3 as we continue our series rooted. It's in Revelation chapter 3 verses 7 through 13 that we will give our focus and attention to on this Lord's Day and hear what the Spirit says to the church. And this is what it says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. and They will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven. In my own new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I want to put tag on this text. I just want to talk about a picture of faithfulness. This Monday, we awaken to the news that the first black Secretary of State, General Colin Powell, passed away as a result of COVID-19 as he was immunocompromised because of medication he was taking to fight a rare form of cancer. As eulogies poured in from around the world of his legacy, he is a testament that it doesn't matter where you start out, God can take you places you would have never imagined you would be. Powell was born in Harlem, New York, raised in the South Bronx. After graduating from Morris High School, he matriculated at City College of New York where he would be a mediocre at best student. Nevertheless, by the end of his life, he has ascended to being the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of State. When you stand back, it was not because of his pedigree or graduating from a prestigious educational institution. His life is simply a testament to the favor of God and his own faithfulness. Such tenacity, perseverance, endurance, and faithfulness is demonstrated by this church in Philadelphia. Just so that we are clear, we're not speaking of the city in Pennsylvania. But remember, we're in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Philadelphia was a city that was erected with the intention of being a cultural hub of Greek culture. While other cities were military outposts, this city was an outpost for the spread of Hellenism. So much so that it was strategically and intentionally located at the junction of several important trade routes, which gained it the name Gateway to the East. It's here in this city of brotherly love that there's a little congregation of believers 
We know they are a little congregation because in verse 8, when Jesus says they have a little power, this is not meant in a pejorative sense. It's actually meant as a commendation to this congregation that though they were small in numbers, they are demonstrating considerable strength. It's so much so that in a city where they are significantly outnumbered, Jesus still has an expectation that they can make a big impact. He proves this because as we will see in the text, Jesus says explicitly that he has placed before this church an open door. Possibly this church teaches us all a valuable lesson that wherever we are in life and whatever we have, it might just be where God wants us to be and what God wants us to have to demonstrate to us that even in seemingly unfavorable circumstances, God can do some of his best work through us. This is just the word that somebody needed to hear on this day. Somebody who's frustrated at where you are in life because it's not where you hope to be. Could it be that it is where God intends for you to be and a place where God can get the greatest glory out of your life and where you can produce the most fruit? We need to get over our somewhere syndrome that causes us to think that success, happiness, fulfillment, and joy are somewhere other than where we are right now. This church is a witness to all of us that God's strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. It's a testament that greater is the one who lives on the inside of me than he that is in the world. And it teaches us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us because God proves over and over again that he can do some of his best work and that we can do some of our most meaningful ministry wherever we are and with whatever God has provided. Listen, church, God's expectation of us is to be faithful no matter what the circumstance may be. We need to listen to what Jesus says to this church because in doing so, it presents for you and for me a picture of faithfulness. Big idea I want to lift before you today is simply this, that God strengthens his church to remain faithfully resilient in the face of resistance. There are four things today I want to lift up out of this text. And first and foremost, in this picture of faithfulness, we can note the providence that enables faithfulness. One would wonder what would embolden this church to remain faithful and rooted in Jesus Christ in the midst of a culture and a city that was averse to that which they believed and that which they represented in the world. Well, Jesus, as he has done in other churches when he introduces himself, is giving the authority by which he speaks to them. Yes, as it says, he is the Holy One, suggesting that there is nobody like him. Yes, he is the true one, making it clear that just as he said in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life, meaning that he is the definitive truth. But note that he says that he, watch this, has the key of David. This is an expression that is another way of saying that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ who fulfills the promise that an heir of David is going to sit on the throne. It is also what one biblical commentator calls the major domo, which is the one who controls entrance to a royal palace, which is a position of the highest authority in the kingdom. That's why by virtue of Jesus having the key of David, he goes on to say that he is the one who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. And when you take all of this together, Jesus is making clear to this congregation in Philadelphia that although they had been shut out, 
and excluded by the wider community, he has the ultimate authority and power to determine who gets into the kingdom. And while they were alienated, ostracized, and marginalized, Jesus lets them know that they are actually a part of the in crowd because Jesus is the one who is is the one who's going to determine who gets into the kingdom. And this ought to be a reassuring word to us church that as Jesus has demonstrated already in Revelation that he is not only with his church as he's walking among the seven candlesticks and he tells each church that he sees them Jesus says to these Christians that he is the one who has the authority that matters. I know that there are some rooms that we might desire to be in, but integrity and holiness either facilitates conviction or exclusion. When you genuinely allow your beliefs to become evident in the way that you live, it's going to place you in a predicament that will cause you to take a stand. As a result of your stance or your stand, you draw a line in the sand or say, as some say, pick a side. And when this happens, the invitations are going to stop coming. The calls are going to become few. The text messages stop. You are unfriended on social media. Then on the inside, exclusion begins to take a toll on you and you're tempted to compromise what you believe for acceptance. But Jesus' word to you is the same as his word to these Christians in Philadelphia that he is the one who we should ultimately be concerned with being in with because at the end of all time only Jesus has the last say as to who gets in and who's left out of the kingdom. Don't waste your time trying to impress and be in with people who don't have the authority or power to determine where you're going to spend eternity. We need to sober up and realize that unless we are alive unto the re return of Jesus, we're all going to die. <laughs> and when we die, our affiliations and memberships in organizations are not transferable into eternity, nor do they hold weight with Jesus. Jesus is looking for those who are faithful over a few things, and he's going to grant them entry into the joy of the Lord. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25, that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he's going to separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus has the last word on your destiny because he has the authority to determine who gets in and who gets cast out. Now I want you to secondly look in this picture of faithfulness at the proof of faithfulness. Notice Jesus' words of commendation for this church in verse 8. And in the A portion of verse 10, Jesus says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. From Jesus' vantage point in his assessment, these believers had proven their faithfulness. We can see this in a number of ways. We see it because without knowing specifically what their works were, Jesus has evaluated their works. And based on his evaluation, he has great expectations for their proven faithfulness because he beckons their attention when he says, behold, which means look, I've set before you an open door. And this open door is a metaphor. It is an image to express that he has presented them with an opportunity. That opportunity is found in where they are. Philadelphia 
is a bastion and a citadel of pagan culture and is located at this intersection of roads, placing it strategically in a place where Hellenism can be exported across the known world. So for these Christians, Jesus is literally saying to these believers, despite the culturally cultural circumstances you find yourself in, use where you are as an opportunity to take the gospel as far as you can as the competing culture is attempting to take their customs, their beliefs, their practices to the end of the known world. Just as they believe in Jesus, their faithfulness gives Jesus reason to believe in them to make the most of the opportunity they have been given. And to punctuate this opportunity, Jesus says that this door that has been opened to them cannot be closed by anyone or anything. Then watch, he says, I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept, <laughs> kept my word and have not denied my name. As I said earlier, when Jesus says they have little power, it's meant that they are small in number, yet they are strong. This small but mighty congregation demonstrates faithfulness in the reality that they have stayed committed to Jesus' word and have not denied his name. Understand, all throughout the Greco-Roman world, there was either persecution or pressure to worship the emperor or some other pagan deity. But from what Jesus says here, when these Christians were pressured and persecuted to deny Jesus, they kept declaring that Jesus is Lord. Then note in verse 10, Jesus says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, they have remained committed while bearing the weight of their witness in a world that does not want anything to do with them. And church, I've got a question for us. What does Jesus see when he looks at us individually and as members of the community of faith? Have we proven ourselves faithful to the point that Jesus can entrust us with an open door that we will take advantage of to expand the kingdom and extend the gospel unto the ends of the earth? Or do we make excuses because of what we perceive we do not have other than seeing the possibility of what can be? Have we capitulated to the culture that surrounds us, compromising our witness and the Christ who saved us? This, I believe, is the internal interrogation that the church and Christians alike have to have as we emerge from this pandemic. Now more than ever, God will be looking for his church to be faithful. As the world reckons with the social unrest, political turmoil, ecological devastation, sickness, suffering, and unimaginable death, we must see these difficult times as an opportunity or an open door to declare to the world that Jesus is the answer for the world today. Even in an age where it is almost acceptable to discredit Christian faith, we must hold fast to what we believe and proclaim. Bill Wilson, in his book, Christianity in the Crosshair, says, when facing opposition, you either become more dedicated or more discouraged. It's your choice. Sisters and brothers, we have a choice to allow the reality we've been presented with to discourage us and make us want to give up or we can become more dedicated to the call. And I wish there were a few people who would not mind affirming that they've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. As a matter of fact, drop that in the chat. Drop it in the comment section. Say no turning back. You've got to get to the point where you say, though none go with me, still I'm going to follow. The world is behind me. The cross is before me. No turning back. But there's a third thing, church, when it comes to a picture of faithfulness that we've got to take note of, and that is the protection in faithfulness. 
Believers must know that although we will be persecuted and ridiculed, God does not sit by idly and allow it to happen. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 9 and the B portion of verse 10. He says, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Again, the reference to the synagogue of Satan is not intended to be anti-Semitic. Craig Kenner says believers in Philadelphia experienced conflict with the local synagogue. Probably they were like the Jewish Christians from whom John first wrote his gospel many of whom were likely expelled from their synagogues. It's apparent that the Christians in Philadelphia had been kicked out of the synagogue. They were ostracized and excluded. But to this point, Jesus says that he is going to make the very ones who kicked them out to come back to them and bow down at their feet and they will learn that they've been loved by God which is to say that when they were executed by those, uh, excluded by those of the synagogue of Satan, Jesus makes clear that they are going to see that he has wrapped his loving arms around those who are his own. As Romans 8 tells us, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then there is mention of the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world. And we don't know if this is referring to an event that has already happened in history, is happening in human history, or that which shall happen in the future. Nevertheless, it is to point to a time when people here on earth are going to be tested. But to be clear, the test is for unbelievers because Jesus says to the church, that he will grant them protection when he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. This seems to suggest that because they have kept the faith, their faith is now keeping them. <laughs> Don't you know that about our God that if you keep the faith, your faith will keep you when times get tough. And we need to hear this particularly when we go through seasons of being antagonized and ridiculed. It can make one feel as if God is aloof, leaving us defenseless. And in these moments, we feel as if evil goes unchecked, but we must know that this is not the case. What we know about our God is that in the midst of it, he can give us grace sufficient to bear it, protection while we face it, and the assurance that ultimately he's going to deal with it. Our responsibility is to remain faithful because Satan knows that he's defeated. And so since he's defeated and that he's not going to win, he wants to keep us distracted. But we should not wince or worry God has us covered. It's been said that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible, which means there is a declaration for each day of the year not to fear. But just in case you need some quick reference, head on over to Psalm 37. Well, the psalmist writes, fret not yourself because of evildoers, but be not envious of the wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Or go on over to Psalm 91, where it says, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes eyes and see the recompense of the wicked are gone over to Isaiah 43 where it says but now thus says the Lord he who created you O Jacob he who formed you O Israel fear not 
for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. And, when, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. And somebody need to hear that on this morning who's going through a difficult time, who has somebody who's gotten on your last nerve. God doesn't want you to take your focus off of what he's called you to do. He wants you to understand the battle is not yours, but it belongs to the Lord, and you've got to let God handle it. And when you let God handle it, he gives you the confidence to face whatever you're going through without fear. For God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us one of power and of love and of a sound mind. I close fourth and finally when it, I have to note with you the promise for faithfulness. I don't have time to unpack all that verses 11 through 13 tell us about the imminence of Christ's return and about holding fast to what we believe so that no one seizes our crown. But I need to draw your attention to what Jesus says in verse 12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. When speaking of being made a pillar in the temple of God, it means that we will have a permanent place in the house of the Lord. And to drive home this point, Jesus says, when you get to my house as a pillar, you're not going to go out anymore. Understand that Philadelphia was located near the epicenter of earthquakes. As a consequence, it was plagued with earthquakes and their aftershocks. This had a devastating effect on the psyche of the residents of the city, so much so that many of them, when earthquakes came, would flee the city. Even some relocated to the wilderness to escape the danger of falling buildings and thus preserving their lives. So when Jesus says that those who overcome will go out no more, he is saying that contrary to your past experiences when your world was rocked and when you sh shall be translated from mortality to immortality, when you go through from being transported from labor to reward, from this terrestrial ball to the celestial shore and from temporality to eternality, these people will never have to leave the house of God because it in God's house, there is safety and security. And if you haven't caught it yet, Jesus is talking about heaven, which is that incorruptible kingdom. My brothers and my sisters, when it seems that your world is crumbling beneath your feet and everything around you is falling to pieces, when it seems that the only thing that is certain is that things are uncertain, our God in Christ calls us to hold on and don't give up. Because God has given us a hope of a place in his eternal kingdom. I love it when that songwriter tells us time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things that are eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. I'm done, but I can't close this message without saying a word about the personification of faithfulness. This church might have been a picture of faithfulness, but I got to tell you about the personification of faithfulness. Jesus personifies faithfulness for you and for me. He was uh, the one who was under the scrutiny of his opponents and the destiny of the Father's will, but who went to Gethsemane to pray. And when he play, prayed about the spirit being willing and his flesh being weak, he had to say to God, it's not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus is the ultimate picture of faithfulness, so much so that the writer in Hebrews chapter 12 and 2 says that we should keep looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He personifies faithfulness, and it's why Paul 
had to write a hymn of praise to Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. You remember those words when he writes beginning at verse 5, have this mind among yourselves that was yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I just want to encourage you. You ought to want to be like Jesus and just like he endured the cross despising the shame and is now seated at the right hand, you and I, brothers and sisters, must remain faithful. And when we cross the river, we have the promise that because of our faithfulness and because we have suffered with and for him, we'll be able to reign with him in his eternal kingdom. No matter how outnumbered you may be, or how small of a minority you may be, keep standing for Jesus Christ. And when you stand for Jesus Christ, you have his presence and providence that will always be with you. You'll know that he will grant you protection. You'll know as well that we have a promise before us that one day we're going to leave this earth and we're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. My brothers and my sisters, there are those of you who are watching who need to make a declaration of your faith knowing that Jesus died for you, that he is risen from the dead and that he is Lord. You need to invite him into your heart. And if you do that, he'll forgive you of your sins. He'll redeem you. He'll give you the hope of eternal life. You ought to make a decision today that as you leave from this moment, you can tell somebody, I've decided to follow Jesus. And to follow Jesus is a lifetime commitment. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. Sometimes we have to climb mountains. Other times we have to tunnel through valleys. Sometimes we have to walk alone. But a believer never walks alone because Jesus always walks with us. If you want to confess your faith and belief in Jesus Christ and accept his invitation for discipleship and eternal life, I'm going to show you how to respond in just a few moments. Then there are others of you who are already saved. You've been journeying the journey of Christian discipleship for some time now. And now you're at a point for whatever reason where you're not connected with the church. And if that's you, we would love to have you as part of Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We are truly a movement of wholeness across this country. And I invite you, my brother, my sister, if the Lord is leading you to connect with us, don't put it off. The day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. If you're in either one of those two categories, you're somebody who's confessing your faith and hope in Jesus Christ, or you're somebody who wants to connect with our church, there are two ways that you can respond. Either you can send an email, email us at connect at the boulevard.org, or send a text message. Text the word belong to 901 446 4242. And you're going to get a link back, whether you send a text message or whether you send an email, you're going to get a link back in reply. Click that link. A form is going to present itself. Fill out that form in entirety. And when you do that, um, it's going to uh, ask of you to submit it. And when you submit it, our team is going to be in touch with you to help you make the next steps on your journey with Jesus Christ. Come on in your homes. You ought to sing it that I have decided to follow Jesus. And as you sing it in your homes, we challenge you, my brother, my sister, send that email, send that text message to make the decision God is calling you to make on today. Declare it today. I've decided 
to follow Jesus. Yes, no turning back. The world may be behind you, but the cross ought to be before you. There's no turning back. Come on, go ahead, send that email, send that text message. Make the decision God is leading you to make. And I guarantee you, your best days will be ahead of you. And you'll have the hope of spending eternity with Jesus Christ. Come on, give God glory, give God honor, and give God all of the praise. Well, sisters and brothers, we are so excited about this opportunity to connect with you. And we look forward with great anticipation for our virtual Founders Day celebration on November 7th and all of the activities that go around at the Boulevard Business Expo that's taking place on the 6th of November. Uh, go to our website and you will see a number of things that are happening. And I encourage you, please remain faithful. Remain faithful in your life groups as we study uh, and go and take a deeper dive into each and every one of these messages. I want to just impress upon us as a church, if you would, make, mark off the next two Wednesdays at 12 noon to join us for corporate prayer as we fast and pray uh, during uh, this time of refreshing that we're seeking from the Lord. God is going to move in an awesome way. You can meet us on Facebook, on YouTube, or you can dial into our conference call line 302-202-1110, access code 319 86 Three. Well, my brothers and sisters, I hope you have a phenomenal rest of this day. I'm encouraging all of our children, our middle schoolers, and our high schoolers to head on over uh, to those worship experiences that are starting at 12 noon. And if you need login info, open up your e-news and it'll show you how to join into each one of those virtual gatherings. Well, let me bless you as we go from this time. God, as we depart from this virtual experience, we're determined now more than ever to remain faithful and to continue following you. And now, God, I bless your people as you instructed Moses to tell Aaron to bless them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace from this time forth, even forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you and God keep you. Have a wonderful rest of the day.